Welcome to another edition of Panther Weekly. My name is Ryan Thompson, Assistant AD for Athletic Communications, joined by the incomparable Tyler Kuhl. Tyler, we're talking about men's soccer today, a program that has certainly been extremely successful throughout the years here for Davenport University. Uh, taking a look at what they did a little bit last year, 10-8-1 overall, and they were 9-4-1 in the GLIAC, and that was good for third place in the conference. Uh, they posted five straight shutout wins to begin GLIAC play. Uh, that was a little bit of a surprise, only in the fact that they played some really tough teams early on in the season. Didn't have some favorable results, but they came back and played really well, like I said, to begin that GLIAC season at 5-0. and Again, they only go, I guess, 1-4-1 one, and one from that point on. But then they did hit some of the meat of that uh, schedule, and that really led to that uh, swoon, I guess you could say, towards the end of the year. Um, seven of their nine GLIAC wins were shutouts. Uh, against their opponent. Um, at the end of the year, they lost in the GLIAC tournament semifinals against Saginaw Valley State University. Uh, that was in uh, Kenosha, Wisconsin, at U University of Wisconsin Parkside. Um, there was a big turnaround in this program, Tyler, and maybe you can talk about this a little bit too, but we went from just three wins in 2018 to 10 wins a year ago. It, you know, it was quite the turnaround because my first season following the men's soccer team was their first year in NCAA play in the GLIAC. They win the GLIAC championship, kind of put themselves on the map, but then the next year, the 2018 season, kind of took a step back, had some key injuries that didn't help them out. And it seemed like early on last year, and because the thing with the 2018 team, there were so many close games that they thought they could have won, just cause something happened towards the end, a bad breakdown that led to them, unfortunately, picking up a loss. And it seemed like early, especially that first game against Lake Erie, a 2-1 loss and had an overtime loss before that against Lynn, you kind of thought, man, is it going to happen again? But then they start the GLIAC play, and they just it had the right guys chipping in at the right time. A lot of close games with those five shutouts, and we saw that with a guy like the goalkeeper, Joshua Dupe. He was phenomenal, outstanding, one of the best goalkeepers last year in the GLIAC conference, and that really just gave that boost of confidence to a, a mixture of young talent but with veteran experience as well. And they're able to push that, and they were able to move up the standings, and it led to a pretty solid regular season. And yes, unfortunately, they came one win short of making it to the GLIAC championship game, but for the, the way the program was kind of heading into last season, there was a lot of uncertainty. And now with a lot of returning players, a lot of big names that are returning from last year's roster onto this year's team, whenever it may start, you're going to see kind of a little bit of that confidence back. Like, hey, we know we can play well in this conference and against some of the top teams here in the GLIAC. When you talk about playing well in the conference, in the first year in 2017, this team won 12 times. And they would have qualified for the NCAA tournament. However, with us being a provisional member of the NCAA Division II at that time, we could not. Won the GLIAC tournament, had some really good contests. Uh, that was played at Northwood University. Uh, beat Northwood in the semis and then beat Saginaw Valley in the finals. Um, so maybe, do you think they could have got spoiled a little bit? Hey, you have that much success in your first year. And like you had mentioned, injuries was a huge part of it. But to go down nine wins, do you think maybe they thought, wow, this isn't going to be as difficult as we thought it was going to be? Well, there were a couple of guys. Like there was, of course, Dylan on the back end. He was hurt for most of that season 2018. And you lost guys like Kavanaugh, who were big parts that graduated and moved on. So there was a little bit of an adjustment period and a lot of new faces. Guys like Matt Whelan, he was a freshman that season and goalkeeping was a little bit of an uncertainty in 2018. And now they were able to build it up. And now, of course, obviously goalkeeping may be a little bit different this year as well. We'll get to that later on. But, and of course, don't forget, that team, that 2017, a lot of those players were part of that national championship team from yeah. before. So they kind of had that winning experience. And that's very important as you get older. And that's why people think having a veteran team is so much important, especially against a lot of these top GLIAC teams. So now having just a little bit older guys and having guys like Dara being a senior, you have Giovanni Duran being a senior, Matt Whelan's now a junior. Those guys know they, what it, they know what it's like to be unsuccessful, but at the same time go and kind of push up towards the top of the GLIAC standings, and that's what Davenport can really carry to the next season. Yeah, it looks like they're looking for some consistency, at least in the NCAA ranks. You had mentioned in 2014, this team won the national championship in the NAIA, uh, ran the gauntlet there and did an extremely good job, and they've been consistent NAIA. I think they want to put back-to-back -back seasons together, double-digit wins. Yep. Um, that's probably where Chris Hughes is at right now with trying to get this program. I mean, if you look at him, his ninth season as the head coach, he's won uh, 696 percentile, uh, 111 wins here at Davenport. So he's had a lot of consistency. So that one year, I think, was an anomaly a little bit um, to see those uh, wins total go down so low. Um, a 263 collegiate wins 
uh, if you include his 152 matches that he won at Calvin College in 10 seasons. So he's been around the block, and he is a perfect general for this team. Yeah, and he's he's got that silent little bit of leadership sometimes. I mean, there'll be, be times you watch him during matches, he'll be very quiet sitting down, but then at the same time, if he needs to get the team riled up, he can get up there and he'll tell the guys, hey, let's play this, especially halftime. He can get the guys going and say the right, get the right message across. And that's what a lot, that's what really happened last year. It was kind of a, like I said, that slow start. And then when they went on the road, and I don't know if it was just not having pressure of playing at home last season, but the team was able to buy in and that's what able was able to, to make this team successful and have a very relatively successful 2019 season. Well, let's take a, a interview here, time to talk with Chris Hughes. You can hear from us, but you'd probably rather hear from somebody within the program. Uh, Coach Chris Hughes, along with Giovanni Duran, I sat down with both of them earlier last week to talk about the 2020 season. And today we have the privilege of being joined by men's head soccer coach Chris Hughes and also a redshirt senior from Wyoming, Michigan, Giovanni Duran. Uh, Coach, we'll start with you with a couple of questions to lead things off. Um, what has been your biggest challenge since the student athletes have returned to campus? <laughs> oh boy, this COVID thing's for sure been a challenge. You know, we we were able to start up for two days with some training sessions, and then boom, done for fourteen days. That's probably the biggest challenge. You know, what I do miss are just those daily interactions with the boys, right? Um, I think that's probably the hardest thing for me. Where I'm just chomping at the bit just to hang with the boys, let alone the football experience, right? So, uh, you know, we're starting back up today here at, at uh, about noon, and uh, I'm just fired up. I need it. Uh, I think it's important to who I am as an individual, and uh, I miss my boys. I'll tell you, that's probably the biggest thing I'm, I'm struggling with. So hopefully we'll start that back up today and, and uh, keep moving forward. You know, how have you and the coaching staff been able to keep the players motivated without a fall schedule? Uh, for sure, it's hard. It's hard. You know, I'm a competitor, and, and if I were in their shoes, um, it'd be a massive challenge, you know. And, and uh, But it's just that gentle reminder that, you know, we're here not only for football, work, but we're here to get our education, get that diploma. And here's an opportunity for a lot of the boys to really dig in uh, get their academics underway. Typically that first week, week and a half, we're on a lot of trips away. So I'm hoping GPA just continues to grow, to continues to get better. So I think that's probably the biggest thing uh, we've learned so far. But um, um, man, I, I, I just want to have that football back into this thing. Yeah. You know, what have you been discussing in terms of a spring season, maybe with the GLIAC, and then what would be your main objectives with the shortened season? Yeah, you know, I, I'm pretty involved with the, the GLIAC coaches, and, and uh, we've got a great group of coaches in the GLIAC, and, and we're trying to figure out what's going to be best for the kids, right, and what's going to be safest for the kids. And, and we keep going back and forth. We're waiting for NCAA to make some decisions, and then the, our league can make some decisions, and then from there our presidents can make some decisions. So it's going to be basically institution by institution, and, and it's not black and white yet. We're hoping to get, you know, the concept of having a game per weekend, is 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 good for the boys you know the two games per weekend is a challenge for sure if you play a friday sunday schedule that sunday is a is, is a barn burner you're just you know part of your, your tactics are figuring out who's still healthy to play in a sunday game so having that one game per weekend could be a pretty neat uh, opportunity trying to get a, a gliac tournament and also and and uh, i think we're getting closer but but uh time will tell how things play out but i'm just excited to get to get a season going this fall getting the boys back out there in the stadium the beautiful stadium we've been blessed with and and uh, that's kind of where we are right now you know how often have you been able to collaborate with other coaches and discuss what they've been doing during this pandemic and kind of compare notes and share ideas yeah, you know, I, I've got a good group of uh, coaching friends out there at different divisions, and and uh, we've been kind of committing back and forth of what they're doing, how they're doing, and I'll tell you, they're it's changing daily. I was out uh, out last night recruiting at, at at local high school, and and I saw three or four coaches there, and we, they were trying to figure out what we're doing, what the, what what I was asking what they're doing, and everybody's doing a little bit different. Uh, everybody has different opportunities per week that they can be with the kids, with the, with the players, and. And uh, so, so there, <laughs> there's, there's no rhyme or reason right now. Everybody's got their own schedule, and and uh, what we're going to do is what we think is best for our players for 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 building this program, not only for this next year for Giovanni, which is on here, 
and uh, but the players to come and, and to respect those players that have played here and 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 bring the best program we can bring. So, um, but but uh, and again, watching social media for sure with with a lot of my friends out there that are coaching at different levels. Uh, everybody's doing some, and every now and then you can pull something from somebody else, which you can apply, which would fit in your program. So we're going to try to do that over the next several weeks and uh, this next spring. You know, you guys had a good, great deal of success last year, 10-8-1 uh, and one overall. You finished 9-4-1 and one in the GLIAC, which was third. You advanced to the tournament semifinals. So we know that you've got a bunch of talented kids coming back. But in terms of recruiting, how about some newcomers? How is the newcomers in the incoming class been in comparison maybe to some seasons past? Sure. <clears throat> I would say this. Um, you know, we had a very good spring uh, this last year. Our boys were, were performing at a very, very high level, even missing uh, Yavani, which which hurt us big time last year. Having him could have been a could have been getting a, could, could get us over that over that hump of that semifinal and and not having George DeVoe in the, in, in the roster last year. And now they're both back there. Uh, well, Yavani is almost back, and, and and George will be back today. And we're looking forward to adding those two pieces for sure because those are. Those are two players that I think can really push us over. But I think the, the incoming class needed to be good. I would talking with staff and, and I really believe that this uh, incoming class is going to help us, uh, is going to affect, uh, is going to deepen uh, what we have. So with us building off of last spring and adding a couple more pieces in, which were crucial, I think we've got a couple guys that, that number one, can contend for those starting spots. Uh, and I've got, I think some of the other ones are going to be ones that we're going to build in in time and, and challenge for those spots, whether it's first year, second year. So coach is very excited. Um, um, but man, let's play some ball, right? <laughs> <laughs> no kidding. Uh, Giovanni, we'll turn things to you. Uh, you know, you missed a significant part of the season last year due to injury. So how has rehab been for you? And are you at full capacity right now? Um, well, rehab actually was quite a struggle, but it actually worked out pretty neat for um, me and our me and our trainer. So it actually made things a lot easier for us. But you know, it was a struggle just not having that physical, you know, person being there cheering you on or you know helping you, just guide you throughout the whole process. Because it was a it was a lengthy process, you know. But um, I think that um, just knowing that there was going to be a season uh really kind of motivated me to keep going even if it was virtually you know but uh trust me it was a it was it was pretty hard here in the whole um delaying down to the spring but hey what can we do and we just keep we just keep grinding sure absolutely um you know what are your goals and maybe some of the team goals that you're going to head into what we hope will be a spring season well to be honest um a couple of the guys we're down about the whole fact that it was being um, canceled or delayed, you know, but it's actually, it's actually a chance for us to like coach told us at one point, instead of cramming two weeks of preseason. And now we have a whole uh, longer amount of period to work out, um, to work out, to get faster, to train out what we usually have a little bit of time to do. And now we have a few months. So we hope to come through the spring season even stronger than we were before when we had two weeks to prepare. So this may actually be a very good thing for us, and we're looking forward to making the best out of the situation. Sure. You know, how have you and your teammates been able to stay in touch during the pandemic and continue to have uh, cohesiveness? Well, we've always stayed in touch throughout uh, – ever since we left, you know, we were, we've always been a close group, and especially now with the with the guys we've added on, um, I think we've clicked quite well, so – um how we stayed in touch we would, since we couldn't hang out or we couldn't train on with other people you know what we always did was uh when we trained individually we'd always when we'd run or something we'd snap a picture send it to our group and just kind of just general reminders to other people like hey get out there you know we're doing this you should be too so keeping others accountable throughout the summer was good you know there was no clubs were playing no ball was being played so Really, it was just held, holding each other accountable of working out and doing whatever you could do. So I think that was how we were able to stay stay close, I guess. You know, you know graduation for you is quickly approaching and you're going to have hopefully a spring season to compete. But what are some of your plans, you know, after graduation? Well, after graduation, I plan uh, after, you know, after the spring season, I'll be at the top of my competition level. So I'll be I'll be good in shape to go out there and hopefully search for, for something at the next level. 
for the for the first few months or a year and i'm hoping to get a contract professionally somewhere if that doesn't happen then i plan on proceeding on to go to the academy so yep those are my future plans as of right now well best of luck to you and again thanks guys for joining me here today i really appreciate your time for everything on the men's soccer program you can visit dupanthers.com you can visit us on social media Ryan, that was a great interview with those two guys. And it's good, of course, to see Giovanni Duran back healthy because I'm sure the Panthers, despite having, like I said, a winning record and a very successful GLIAC play conference, I'm pretty sure they would have loved to have Duran back. Yeah, he's certainly a huge piece. And we'll talk about some of the positional breakdowns here in a second. But, yeah, he, he's a kid that is a hard worker. Uh, it's got to be hard to miss almost the entire season. You have to rehab and get back. And then you have a pandemic where you can't get back in the fall. And then you certainly don't know what's going to happen in the spring. But hopefully he can get back on the field and perform well this year for the Panthers. Yeah, and of course, I mean, it's the, I guess the only positive of having a pandemic is that you will know that you're going to be 100% healthy coming back from, I mean, having a year and a half off just about, especially for a couple guys that, of course, one another we'll get to when we talk about the players. Yeah. Well, let's break down some of the positions here, Tyler. Let's start with let's start with goalkeeper. I mean, really, that's the guy that uh, stirs the drink, I guess they say. If you don't have a strong goalkeeper, that could be problems on the back end. And we saw that last year with Joshua Duke playing goalkeeper. Unfortunately, not going to be on the roster this year. But we did see a, a guy a couple years ago. His name was Aaron Orban. People remember him because he was outstanding as a goalkeeper. Player of the year, player of the week. He was pretty much the heartbeat of the Panthers roster. And so far, the only returner that the Panthers have in goal is going to be Marcus Sunday in the sophomore. And he only played a little bit last year, played a couple games early on, but as soon as Dupe got hot, Hughes ran with him the entire year, and Sunday only played sparingly. Now, obviously, as the veteran goalkeeper here, we may see him a little bit more, at least at the beginning, whenever the season starts, because obviously with a couple of newcomers, you'll want to like kind of get them, you know, kind of ease them into the lineup. But with Sunday now being a sophomore, kind of having that veteran status, you may see him get the first start for the Panthers. Yeah, he might. But one of the guys, and doing some research and looking up some of the information, Carter Selvia. I don't know if you've seen him or read up on him at all, Tyler, but he'll be a redshirt senior. He's from Byron Center. He went to South Christian High School. He's played the last three years at Cedarville, a Division II school. Okay. And he has logged over 4,000 career minutes in goal. Um, Cedarville is a program D2, like I said. They qualified for the Nationals last year. Um, he has a 0 0.77 career goals against average, 23 career wins, and 17 career shutouts. So That's not bad. You lose dupe, but I think Chris is like, look, we got to get somebody comparable, if not better, to be honest. Um, so he's going to come in. He had a 0 0.66 goals against last year. Uh, pitched two shutouts, I know, in the regionals. They went to PKs, won the first game, lost the second. So I have a feeling Chris is feeling very good in the coaching staff about Carter coming in. And that's obviously going back to the veteran status and having a guy like Selvius come in because, I mean, it's nice to have a local guy here too yeah. as well because – and, I mean, Orban was here. Orban was from Michigan, if I'm not mistaken, right? But Sutton's Bay, yeah. Sutton's Bay, Up yep. near Traverse City, yep. So, well, it's, that's on the western side of Michigan-ish, sure. if you put a line down the middle. God's country but, up there. Yeah. Wine country. Wine country. Wine, cherry country up there. But, I mean, it's good to see. I mean, it'll be interesting to see how, who starts when, because once this pandemic started, and you've seen it with other sports, whoever's really the better-looking keeper coming out of camp will be probably the one that gets the first start, whether it be Selvius, whether it be Sundin. I'm interested to see some good goaltending competition. I mean, the worst thing you could have is a goalkeeper controversy on who you want to start. I'm pretty sure that's a problem that Chris Hughes would love to have. Yeah, and I think Marcus is chomping at the bit to get back in there. I'm sure he's fighting as hard as he can to get that starting role back. I don't think Chris is just going to hand it to Carter and say, here you go. Right. But... The numbers speak for themselves. He's had a very successful career already at the Division II level, so that's going to make it hard for Marcus to, to earn those minutes. But I'm sure right now those guys are going back and forth, hopefully learning from each other. And I'm sure that's a position where he feels pretty good, Chris does, and so does the coaching staff about coming into this upcoming spring season is we got two guys that are capable of doing the job. And especially with the fact that, and the overlooming fact that if you go from spring to a fall season, you're not going to want to just play one kid the entire time and then have him not be ready for the fall. So you may see him split early on, kind of so we saw with Dupe and Sundin last year, have them split early on and then see who you want to ride the horse with the rest of the season. I think you're going to see a lot of uh, experimenting this year, Tyler. I think you're going to have probably seven matches if all goes well. And I think you're going to probably split time. Um, a lot of these guys can come back and will come back in that fall season just a couple short months after the spring wraps up. I know a lot of programs, and we talked with, with this about football, you do want to try to limit injuries a little bit. Obviously, yeah. you can't do that. You can't go half speed. That's usually when you can get hurt more. Right. But I think this is going to be the time where Chris can 
insert some different players, um, experiment, like I said, with some different lineups, and I think he'll go ahead and do that. So um, I think he is going to take this spring as a learning opportunity more than anything and see what he's got. It's almost like spring camp. Yeah. And just a very competitive spring camp, and that's going to be with all these sports, is that you're going to be like, all right, so we know what we have next season because – I mean, obviously, these kids will be losing a year of eligibility. And these, st these teams will still compete for, you know, some form of a championship. However, it's going right. to be almost looking forward to when they have the full season coming in the fall. Yeah, and again, it's going to be a championship. At least that's what the plan is, is going to have a GLIAC tournament. You know, they're going to have that in the spring. Uh, let's shift gears a little bit. We're going to stay on the back end and talk about defense. Lasse Pico Kelson, the 2019 GLIAC Defensive Player of the Year. The Great Dane. Oh, I mean, he was solid for them for a number of years. Um, this program has also been really good on defense. Stephen Carroll, the 2017 GLIAC Defensive Player of the Year. The back end is really strong. They also have Jake Van Shee. He's a senior from England. 51 career starts with four assists a year ago. Uh, I should say four assists in his career total. Um, you have Darren Collins, a sophomore from Ireland. He played in three matches last year. I think he'll be asked to do a little bit more this year, at least as, as of right now. Six guys on defense on the roster, so you got to keep those guys healthy. Um, you got Ben Senjic, who's a sophomore transfer from Aquinas. He played 12 matches last year and started six times for the Saints uh, in the NAIA ranks. Um, taking a look at uh, Kean Quinn. He started all 19 matches as a freshman. He did have one goal. I think he's going to fill that role that Lasse left. I think he's 6'3", built like a truck, and I think he's somebody that will be really steady in the back end. If I'm not mistaken, he played right center back because uh, typically in soccer or football for our fans overseas, it's you'll have four back guys on the back end, and Lasse, since he was left-footed, would play on the left center back. Quinn was right next to him. So he was able to watch Kelson a lot last year. So he learned a lot from Lasse. And then you had Van Sheet off to the right. And then the left was kind of, you know, a mixture between Carson Brink. Sometimes Keegan Bailey would go in and fill back there. So it'll be interesting to see who Coach Hughes puts there. Obviously, on the left side, you want to have someone who is favorable with the left foot just so they can move the ball up that side better. Sometimes you see right footers, I mean, that just have to go on their off foot, if you will. But I mean, Van Sheet. He's he's a very he's really good at moving the ball up the field. Very aggressive, I will say this. I'm pretty sure he leads the Panthers in cards in his career, if not pretty darn close. But he'll be someone that's very important. And Quinn, I was really impressed watching him last year. It, just the way he matured as the season went on. Sophomore, he almost looks like a senior. Yeah. Well, and then two other guys that I didn't mention before. Sam Larkins, who's going to be a freshman, 6'2", from England. And then also Danny Nichols. He's from Whitehall, Michigan, but he spent his high school days at IMG Academy in Bradenton, Florida, one of the top, I guess, prep schools in the country. So he's played an extremely difficult schedule the last couple of years. I think Chris will ask him to come in and contribute as well. He played in 16 matches last year for IMG Academy. Um, let's look at the midfielders. I mean, this team is loaded. I, I counted only about four guys that aren't coming back this year. So this team, double-digit wins, and there's no reason why they can't extend that. You guys got uh, Dara O'Riordan, uh, senior from Cork, Ireland. First team all GLIAC last year. He was also third team all region. And this is a unique distinction. He was offensive and defensive player of the week last year, was Tyler. It, so you can show his all-around play. Was it consecutive weeks or it was in the same month? It I'm was split sure. up. A couple weeks split up. But yeah, it, was, uh, yeah, it wasn't yeah. the same week. I remember that. But he it's funny because he can play that defensive role very well because typically he lines up on the backside of the midfield. Hughes likes to put one midfielder kind of on the offensive end. That's why we see Owen Brocken a lot. But then Overeem would kind of fall to the back. This year, he's had he had to do double duty with losing a guy like Duran all last season. He had to move up and play some offense as well. And he ended up being one of the top scorers for DU. Finished second in scoring with 13 points, five goals, and three assists. He was efficient because he was able to play at both ends of the pitch, and which is very vital, especially for a successful team. Yeah, and he's a guy that controls the tempo extremely well. He's got great on-ball skills. Um, you hardly ever take it away from him, and he's really quick with his feet. He hardly ever gives it up, and that's something you want out of the midfield. You want to push the tempo the other way. You don't want to give the ball up and lead to a transition for the other team. Um, Owen Brocken, uh, a sophomore from Ashburn, um, Ireland, he was first team all GLIAC as of just a freshman. He had five assists that tied for the team lead, and he played and started in 18 matches. A low center of gravity, about 5'7", but he wins a lot of one-on-one -on -one balls, and he's also a very aggressive player. And he's got a real good leg, too. If you ever see, if you ever watch a Davenport game, there's always seems like a couple guys that'll do the free kicks. You'll see, like, Lasse and Keon Quinn, they'll run up to the front because they're big, tall guys, but then it'll be either Dara or it'll be Owen Brocken 
on the free kicks because Dara's right foot, left foot's Brocken, so it kind of is able to have that little bit of mixture, and they both have really good legs, and that's why Brocken was able to get five assists because he was able to get the ball into the high danger scoring areas. And yeah, let's take a look at just run down some of the other midfielders. Brock Schultz, a senior from Clarkston, he's in 51 career matches under his belt. He's a guy that's come off the bench in the years past and done an extremely good job, especially with some of the injuries that this team had in 2018. Evan Marquess, a junior from Madawan, four goals and four assists last year. Strong left foot. He's another guy that likes to take a lot of the free kicks uh, from outside the 18-yard box and beyond. Uh, Ryan Zietlow, a senior from Spring Lake, three goals and one assist in 19 matches a year ago. Uh, Giovanni Duran, like we had mentioned, the redshirt senior from nearby Wyoming. Uh, again, he played just two games last year, had season ending injury. A key piece back, 61 career games he's played in. He has nine goals and five assists. And then Tyler Welch, a junior from Milford High School. He saw a significant role increase from his freshman to his sophomore season. He started 16 matches, two goals and two assists a year ago. And then finally to round out the midfielders, George DeVoe, a redshirt freshman from Muskegon, Mona Shores. He missed all of last season due to injury. I think he'll see some significant time this year. He had 20 goals and nine assists as a senior in high school. That's not too bad, I would say. I would say that's a pretty good career for most guys in high school. And he managed to do that in just one. Uh, and then we'll wrap up this uh, preview of the year with the forwards. You imagine Matt Whelan, a junior, a retro junior from Cork, Ireland, first team all GLIAC last year, again, third team all region with Dara. Uh, he led the team and was fifth in the GLIAC with eight goals. He had five assists to tie Brocken uh, for the team lead there. 67 shots total, 31 on goal. So he's not afraid to fire away. He will... I, I, there'd be at least four times a game where he would just absolutely, you'd see him line up and he'll probably be 35 yards away and I would think in my head, he's going to kick this. He's going to go for it. It may miss, but it may hit target and he's got a leg to do it. That's why he led the Gleak in shots last year. Named all region by United Soccer Coaches and he's a guy that plays a lot of passion and he's got the framework too. To, he's able to get up the field quickly, but he's also when the ball's in that six-yard box and needs to win those battles, he's got the size to do it. Yeah, he does and Justin Sikama, going to be a sophomore from North Muskegon. He played over 1,000 minutes a year ago as a freshman. He started 13 times. Four goals and one assist. I think for him, he scored most of those goals early in the year. He scored in his season debut, his, his collegiate debut against Florida Tech. That was a 4-1 loss, so he was the guy that had the tally in that game for DU. I think he just needs more consistent from start to finish. Like I said, four goals is pretty good, but three of those came early in the year. And that's the thing, too, with a freshman. You, you learn, because obviously he learned quickly the high, difference in high school and Division II collegiate soccer, and that's one, I mean, he got the goals early, and I'm not, and obviously sometimes consistency can be tough for young kids, and thankfully he's got a good group around him that can say, hey, you got to push it forward, because Whelan has been a guy of his freshman year. He started off with a really good year, and that kind of tailed off towards the end last year, a little bit more consistency. So I think with Sikkim's second year, he'll learn that he's got to keep pushing. It's a lot. I mean, this year, the spring season will be a short season, so you don't have to worry about that long grind, but preparing for that inevitable long grind when we go back into the fall type schedule, that's something Sikkim's going to want to learn. Yeah, and rounding out that group, uh, two guys that I wanted to mention that they lost. Miguel Flores scored five goals all off the bench last year. Didn't start in a single game. I think they're going to miss his energy late in games. He would come in, provide a spark. A lot of times would score a goal that either tied or put the team ahead. So he's, they're going to miss his energy for sure. And then Braden Texer, um, four-year player for this team. He scored three goals last year. I know I scored, I think, one or two maybe on senior day, which was good to see him yep. go out uh, on, that, on top and, and do that. So those are some of the guys that are gone. So I think the forward position is strong. I think some of these midfielders are capable of scoring. I think you're going to probably get more production out of that mid, some of the mids this year in terms of goal scoring. But I think that pretty much wraps it up. I think we went through just about everybody. I know that was maybe a little bit long-winded, everybody out there, but thanks for you know, sticking with us. I know we like wow. to talk sports, and particularly a, a good program like this men's soccer team. Well, you know, I mean, uh, my previous uh, co-host the last couple weeks, he's kind of he's short for words sometimes. Hi, Cooper. Nice to see you. <laughs> but, no, uh, it's, there's going to be a lot of great stuff here with this men's soccer team, and I'm excited to see whenever the season starts that we get back at it and uh, be calling some action. Well, we if you allow me to. Well, we couldn't do this or anything here at Davenport without the help of our very generous sponsors. Of course, Adidas, the official outfitter of Davenport Athletics. We also have Uccello's Restaurante. Have you been there, Tyler? That is an amazing place. <laughs> I've only I mean, been there a few times. A beautiful shaped, is this a circle or U-shaped? It's a nice bar, I know that. Not that I go there for that purpose only, but no. <laughs> it's a really good place. So, oh boy. Oh, we lost the lights. Oh, Clap gosh. on. See, that's there how long see. it's been. It's been so long that we lost power. But we're <laughs> back. Uh, the Clapper is a... Uh, 
I don't want. They're not a sponsor, but that did work in that instance. Yes. Um, but anyways, you tell us on Broadmoor Avenue here in Caledonia. Go out there and enjoy everything they have to offer. And get some pizza puffs. Pizza puffs. Uh, you know. Cooper's losing. I like them. I, lo I love them. Cooper does not, apparently. Cooper, but that's okay. That, that's okay. Uh, Chick-fil-A, wonderful chicken there. Again, don't go on Sundays. I think Cooper mentioned that last time. <laughs> Vital information. Uh, Meyer, can't forget about Meyer. Uh, you need your groceries. And then certainly the Drury Inn and Suites, the official hotel of Davenport Athletics. Next week, Cooper's back in the hot seat. I probably will be behind the camera. You may like that better. Uh, maybe comment below on YouTube uh, and let us know who you like better. We'll be talking women's volleyball. That's a program underneath uh, Coach Brian Netzler. Uh, Cooper covers that extremely well here at Davenport University. But I think that's it for today's show. Yeah, it was definitely a fun talk. And uh, can't wait to talk about volleyball and all the other sports we got here at DU. Again, follow us on social media, please. We're uh, building our... <laughs> please? Please. <laughs> please. Well, we're building, you know, building our database. That's not the right word, but we're building at our D. social Athletics. media. At, yep, yep, at DU Athletics. Let's see, Instagram. Let's see, Facebook, Twitter, all those fun ones, whatever else you'd like to do. When I, well, if, when they watch the Panther, when they see the intro, it's on the bottom. Yeah, all, all you kids know what I'm talking about. So get on the social media, get on the line, go to DUPanthers.com. For Ryan Thompson, Tyler Cool, we'll see you next time.